Good afternoon. I'm Tom Erspalmer, Executive Board Member with the World Affairs Council of Orange County. And I wanna welcome all of you to today's program, Emerging Technologies and Great Power Competition, a conversation with Dr. Melissa Griffith of the Wilson Center. Uh, first off, I wanna thank our partners in today's event, the World Affairs Council of Charlotte and the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. The format of our program will be an open conversation between Dr. Griffith and our program moderator, which will last about 40 minutes, at which time uh, Dr. Griffith will take questions from our audience. If you have a question at any time during the program, uh, please click on the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and feel free to type in a question of any length. We welcome your questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Now I'd like to introduce today's program moderator. Pirit Pernik is a researcher at the strategy branch of NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Based in Tallinn, Estonia, Pirit leads the Cyber Defense Center's research project on securing 5G networks for NATO military mobility. She recently reorganized the center's, excuse me, she recently co-organized the center's first joint NATO military 5G security workshop. And she also co-edited a volume on emerging and disruptive technologies entitled Cyber Threats and NATO 2030, Horizon Scanning and Analysis. Uh, that published in December and was launched just last month. And I wanna give special thanks to Pirrit because she is now uh, in a 10, uh, uh, 10 hours ahead of us. And so she's getting up late and staying up late for us. So now I'm going to turn it over to our program moderator, Pirrit Pernick. Pirrit. Good evening. Um, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and for hosting this event and I'm very happy to moderate discussion with Dr. Griffith. Uh, I would also like to mention that um, in addition to what Thomas mentioned, my center is also developing a 5G open source testbed for the use of our cyber defense exercises. But without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Melissa Griffith. Uh, she is a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a non-resident research fellow at the University of California, Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, and an adjunct assistant professor at Georgetown Center for Security Studies. Among other topics, she inve investigates the security implications of 5G and the emerging technologies and great power competition. Her forthcoming book investigates how small countries have become significant providers of national cyber defense. Uh, Melissa, uh, to uh, frame the discussion today, I uh, would like to mention that many countries have recognized that uh, security threats are vital for uh, 5G rollout and over 50 countries have joined the US Clean Network Initiative, among them 27 of NATO countries. And as many has signed the MOU on 5G security with the US. Also uh, NATO and EU have integrated 5G considerations into their risk assessments. So my first question to you is uh, why the security of 5G networks has emerged as such an important national security issue recently, and perhaps uh, consider it even more important than other emerging and disruptive technologies such as AI uh, and com quantum computing, and why uh, it is more important uh, than the previous generations of uh, radio networks which have more vulnerable technologies than the 5G security. 
over to yes. you, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction, Pret. So I think that this is a really good starting place for any conversation about 5G and national security. Sometimes we uh, start, we'll put the cart up front of the horse a little bit and we start on some of the very specific security concerns and get into the weeds very quickly. Um, but I think the framing question is actually a, a, a more logical place to start. So when we think about why if I was sort of in a room and I said, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say 5G, a good number of the listeners uh, today and when you're watching this back in the future are gonna say security and national security. It's become very, very tightly associated with that conversation. And that's for a couple reasons. Um, the first reason is just that what 5G networks enable, what are they and what do they enable? And these are those kind of three buzzwords that I'm sure many of you have heard, which is the conversations about low latency, higher reliability and more connected devices. And that kind of three punch combo, those sort of three different evolutions or technological advances make it possible to do types of use cases that require significant reliability, pretty good speed, so you don't wanna lag, um, kind of when what you're engaging with, and then to be able to do that at scale. So when you hear driverless cars, at scale in cities, 5G is what makes that possible at that scale. Remote surgeries, when we talk about industrial manufacturing kind of applications or agriculture applications, all of those are really relying on that low latency, more reliability and the scalability in terms of normal kind of number of devices in that space. So that sounds really great. That's kind of the promise of 5G. Um, what makes it concerning from a national security perspective is really twofold. The first kind of category of concern is about critical dependency. So this is all the things that will rely on 5G networks. Uh, 4G networks, 3G networks, 2G, 1G, all of these are telecommunications networks and there's a significant amount of other critical services, sectors, activity that run on those networks and 5G just really amplifies that when we're talking about really radicalizing connectivity with these networks. That means that if a malicious actor, state or otherwise wanted to target these, act these activities, these networks through what we would call CNA, computer network attacks, um, they could disrupt, deny, degrade those capabilities. And so that's a single point of failure. You could take out 5G networks and compromise electricity grids, manufacturing systems, um, stop a remote surgery in its tracks, crash a car. And those are considered single points of failure. So that's one set of concerns. Those are commercial applications. And I think given a lot of your work, I would be uh, remit if I did not also mention that there are military applications that depend on this as well in that space, that this could be a single point of failure. The other set of concerns is a telecommunication specific. So critical dependencies, that's a critical infrastructure concern. Um, telecommunications awkward, uh, occupy a very interesting space because of the sheer amount of data that traverse those networks. And that's been true since the day of the telegram forward. Um, 5G is gonna really amplify both the complexity and the volume of that data, given what we're connecting and operating on those networks. If you are a state or non-state actor, malicious or otherwise, that's a really wonderful opportunity for espionage operations, which is that CNE, computer network exploitation, um, where it's the, the gather, gathering of data. So when we think about why these are critical, it's they revolutionize what we can run on them. That's that low latency, more reliability, more connected devices. It puts them in an even more critical position in terms of dependencies, single points of failure, really prime target for those types of operations. And then at the same time, the kind of data running through these networks is really aggregating that for you, putting them in a single place. And that really makes it a good kind of prime target for espionage operations. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very good overview of uh, most critical uh, threats. You mentioned uh, critical dependency uh, of critical infrastructure, single point of failures, a massive amount of data uh, flowing through the, those networks and the concern of the espionage. So um, I would like to uh, move a little bit more deeper <laughs> into this nitty gritty and uh, uh, ask you to, um, what do you think, uh, what are the, uh, should be the primary national security concerns among all those um, uh, palette of, of threats for the national governments? And for example, the press has usually focused on the um, destruction of critical infrastructures, uh, going, turning off the power grids, um, also uh, regarding the, uh, not flow of uh, data, but especially um, government sensitive data and uh, allies uh, intelligence and security information. 
uh, that those could be compromised. And also, uh, what do you think of um, such um, kind of um, less, maybe high level uh, threats as a violation of privacy and, and just gathering massive amounts of uh, Western consumers' data in order to train, for example, Chinese AI systems? And, um, and what about even those threats that uh, we still yet don't comprehend because there could be new attack vectors that we can't even imagine as the deployments of the networks haven't yet taken mm. place and standards are still under development. Yeah, the sort of known knowns, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns and the, that last category, the unknown unknowns are the ones that uh, tend to keep you up at night because you don't see them coming and you know they could be consequential. So I think I'm gonna kind of pull those questions apart a little bit and do my best to kind of walk through them because um, I think there's a lot there that's worthy of some attention. So we've talked about kind of broadly why a malicious actor might even wanna consider targeting 5G networks, like why even care from a national security perspective. When we start to talk about how they might target, that's where kind of the rubber meets the road, right? So there's opportunity, real interest, strategic utility, operational utility, how would you do that? What are your sort of vectors in? And I think it's really helpful because a lot of the conversation, American, uh, a lot of the conversation in the United States has been very specific country and vendor, right? So if you say 5G, China, Huawei, CTE, and those tend to be a large amount of that conversation. So when we think about the vectors, I wanna pull that apart a little bit because I think we've oversimplified the conversation significantly. There's sort of two avenues that you might introduce in security into a network any network. One is what's called the untrusted vendor problem. And this is really where questions about China, Huawei, ZTE come in. And the analogy here is that if you have a really shady individual build your house, right, from the ground up, they have not only access to your plans and maybe know the weaknesses in your security system, but maybe they also kept a key and they could let themselves in later. That's a lot of the concerns around kind of Huawei um, and ZTE, their sort of positions they hold, is they have undue access perhaps to these systems. Um, the secondary concern there is in some areas, they're one of a handful of vendors, which means that they are kind of a resiliency concern as well if they were to pull out or pull support, um, that they could disrupt those networks in that way. So that's one category, untrusted vendors. Very important, and I don't wanna undermine it or sort of convince anyone in the room they shouldn't be concerned about that category, uh, but that tends to get most of the oxygen in debates in the United States and sort of up to date. The other category concern is what I tend to call vendor neutral. So it is not about geographic country of origin or a specific company that you think is trusted or untrusted. It's much more about what do these systems look like, right? And these get to a lot of your conversations and the point you correctly raised in sort of your introduction to this question, which is about data security, right? The confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems. Um, how do you redesign the types of security architectures we deploy when we're looking at a much more disaggregated network, so no longer a hub with spokes where you can perform cyber hygiene, but a much more disaggregated network. Handle the speed of these networks. Um, speed is a beautiful thing from use cases. It's also a terrible thing for malicious code, right? That cuts both ways. How do we think about legacy systems and the ways that we're addressing existing security concerns there? Um, because particularly in the United States, and this is also true globally, a lot of these developments are what we call brownfield, right? Which means they build off existing 4G infrastructure. They're sort of augmenting that infrastructure versus setting up a completely separate network. because These are existing incumbents in the market. So there's all those sets of concerns in addition to the sort of Huawei specific. So my response to you would be when we think about what are the most pressing, I would challenge us first um, to not just say what's most pressing and react to the geopolitical concerns, but rather say, what is our risk landscape? Where are our vulnerabilities? Where are areas where we already have good organizational operational best practices or technological standards that can help us address some of those areas? Where are there not? Um, can we simply replace vendors in certain parts of the stack? For the United States, that's an easier proposition because we have a different dependence on Huawei and ZTE than some other countries do. So I push us on the risk landscape piece first before we start jumping down into like where are the most pressing and where should we focus the most? Mm. Yes, thank you. That, that's a very comprehensive <laughs> answer. So now um, I totally agree that uh, if, uh, for example, uh, Huawei was asked by Chinese intelligence to insert a code into software update, uh, and uh, through this, it could control parts of 5G networks, 
it is impossible uh, that it could be detected. So the mm. discussion focusing on the back, uh, back doors is, is uh, too narrow and uh, we, we, we should uh, look at it much more broadly and not, nevertheless, uh, coming uh, to the great power competition and the China issue, as you mentioned already, so my next question would be that um, technology in general and 5G in particular seem to go hand in hand with concerns over China. Uh, could you help us to frame that concern? Uh, wh why is technology so important for the emerging great power competition that we are witnessing? This is a fantastic question. I actually want to um, disrupt you a little bit and jump back to a point you just made before I, I head into this, this question about sort of backdoors. I think sometimes we oversimplify the relationship between Chinese companies and the Chinese government. Um, so I think you don't have to deploy any malicious intent around Huawei and ZT. There's been significant evidence that these are buggy systems, um, which means that like maybe you didn't design it so the door is open, but the door is open, um, not just for China, but other types of actors. And then I think the secondary part of that concern is that um, there are ways around some of those. So I think sometimes we simplify this. If you want 100% certainty that you will not have untrusted access to your systems around vendors, then you should not use untrusted vendors, right? If you want to completely eliminate that specific source of risk. Uh, that said, we tend to simplify the China question to just Huawei and ZTE and their China and their companies have a large presence across the ecosystem and across the stack, not just on those specific components. Um, so there's a lot of procedures and efforts in place around how you operate on untrusted systems securely and a huge amount of work that's being done there, but also a real conversation about um, creating some checks and ability to talk about supply chain. So for example, Ericsson does funnel large amounts of its software through Sweden when it's working on um, the specific software levels of its applications. And that's a way for them to authenticate and certify as they go along. I apologize, the mailman is driving by and my dog is letting us know we have a perimeter breach. Um, but that's a, another way of getting to some of these questions. So there are, are ways that you can mitigate those risks. You cannot 100% ameliorate them. Um, but if you're gonna 100% ameliorate them, you have to remove the untrusted vendors. Great power politics. This is uh, the, the elephant or sometimes people would say the panda in the room. Um, that you can't say 5G without China, but the kind of question about China, geopolitics, competition, contestation, whichever term you prefer there, uh, is not boiled down to just 5G, right, and, and, it, and its core and its epicenter. So I think when we think about China, which sometimes gets framed as the China problem, which I think is a little bit too um, malicious in, in its framing, you have a country that is rising quite rapidly, um, that sometimes still talks about itself as a developing country, but on a lot of metrics, I think most countries in the United States and Europe would not be inclined to place them in that same position. So a rising power, um, sometimes re I referred to as a geostrategic competitor. They are leveraging technology, which is this new foundation upon which states project power. And you see that around a lot of the discussions happening in NATO, um, the kind of geostrategic technologies, but it's also a really critical vulnerability for those countries because they rely on those as sources of national power. So it makes them sort of unique targets. And that's kind of the overarching area of concern is we're really running up against China um, in an active contestation in this space. What makes 5G really interesting as a case of that, although it can't encompass the whole US-China conversation, um, is that it really exemplifies a series of those, right? So the real rise of innovation around specific infrastructure, um, the real push of a different national model to how you leverage and encourage and build out your industry, both domestically in terms of a domestic market, but also export. And here is sort of the Silk Road initiatives um, into Latin America and Asia and the Middle East, which is a very different model. You also have really interesting moments of very different ways you interact with these systems. So China is one of the largest and most prolific cyber espionage actors in the world. And a large amount of that activity is focused on intellectual property and intellectual property theft, which um, is an area of activity that China has pursued pre the sort of cyber espionage operations and continues to pursue in things sort of like um, forcing kind of revelations in court around suing around particular patents. There's a lot of different ways that you can access intellectual property, but there's that kind of transfer component that's troubling if you're the United States and you see these as elements of power 
And then that last piece, which is the United States isn't in the position we were in the 90s, right? Or even with 4G, where we're the dominant infrastructure group, both at the level of the applications and also um, in some of the build outs of those systems and earlier in 3G, the architecture. So there's a real moment of, um, of panic, both in terms of maybe not being in the leadership role we have historically been accustomed to, or our allies have been in that role. And at the same time, seeing a real shrinking of who's able to compete in that space and China looking like they have a, a successful idea of what their national model looks like. And we in the United States, and I think in Europe need to actually answer that call and say, if that's their model, what's ours? So 5G sort of slots into those broader debates. Um, a useful case study for it, but even if you solved everything in 5G, you still wouldn't address that broader set of concerns with China. Yes, yeah, so, so in this context, if you look at um, divergent approaches of the European al allies, so some of them still want to keep the door open for the long term strategic relationship with China. And, uh, for example, just to mention Hungary, Turkey and Montenegro that uh, have not joined the clean network initiative. And also the recent uh, decision by Germany not to uh, face out or ban Huawei outright with the new uh, uh, IT security law. So what is your kind of take on this that uh, how do sh should we um, retaliate uh, against uh, those uh, those um, divergent approaches or 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 and and how do how should we uh, attain that common approach across the alliance, especially in the context that uh, some countries, some politicians uh, do support uh, the Chinese agenda and, and the strong lobby from the industry, both from Chinese companies, but also Western companies. And uh, how do we turn this discussion back to the democratic values and, and uh, principles and, and that we want to uphold the free and open internet and not to um, propagate the digital authorita authoritarianism. So, so how do we, how do we um, jungle in this <laughs> great yeah. power competition? <laughs> Yeah, so this is the, the golden ticket policy question, right? So that if you, you have the, the single efficient answer to this question, you can retire today. Uh, it's incredibly complex. I think there's actually a couple things going on here, though. Um, I think we're sometimes a little bit too sensationalist about the divisions that do exist uh, between countries. So I think there's a couple things we can observe to give us a little bit of, of hope, right, to stay on the positive side of this. The first thing is that there are groups of countries that are now emerging as sort of coalition of countries that have a really shared perspective here. Uh, and if you, you don't need to look any further than Five Eyes to see that really solidifying that kind of core intelligence alliance for the United States um, and kind of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, that core group. Uh, and you see a lot of agreement there, both in terms of the assessment of the threat and the types of responses that need to be required um, from that threat. When you're looking at the EU or NATO more broadly, I think that aperture widens a little bit. We still have, and I would still push widely, an agreement that we have a problem, which is half of your, your fight, right? Which is that this is a real sense, like source of insecurity for countries, both in terms of the role that China will play here, um, but also just that we need to be addressing critical infrastructure security, regardless of which countries are competing in that space. There's that recognition. And there's a recognition of kind of the concerns around China, Huawei, CTE in that space. Where we're seeing disagreement and active debate is the so what question, which is, okay, if that's the risk, what do we do about it? And I'm a bit of a realist here. I don't think all countries will come to the same decision. And that's because they don't start in the same spot, right? So if we look at the United States, this is a country that still, if you break that kind of ecosystem of 5G down, has really strong players in most of the spaces, actually all of them, except for the RAM, the radio access network. It's the only spot we don't have a player. Everywhere else, we're pretty dominant in that industry. So we're starting actually from an area that's not uh, grim as some people would make it out to be. Um, we also don't have a lot of Chinese vendors in our existing 4G, 3G systems. Right, and you saw this around kind of estimations coming out about replace and rip costs. Those were largely in rural areas, rural vendors. Um, so the scope and scale and the cost of addressing the existing challenge before you even talk about 5G, the existing infrastructure, really different. 
right, in terms of what we're asking for the government and our industry to foot in terms of the bill um, and just sheer physical cost of that. Also really different positions, because if you're looking at countries like Germany, which you referenced, uh, much higher dependence across the ecosystem already before you even have the 5G conversation. That's a very different rip, replace, or replace and rip, whichever order you would prefer to phrase those um, question. The United States is also in a very different geopolitical position relative to China, right? And a lot of the language you hear from the United States is about pure power competition, geopolitical rivalry, contestation between two rising technical powers, right? Um, and it really puts them as jostling in that, in that framework. And I think that both China and the United States see that as a jostling between these countries. Um, Germany is not looking to jostle geopolitically with China in the same way that the United States is, right? That's not a strategic interest for Germany. Germany is caught in this really tricky position as is a France, for example, um, where they wanna remain strong economic and security partners of the United States, but also see a really important role of China in their economic future. And they're trying to manage that tightrope, right? So I think this is why you see countries like France coming out with a slightly, I wouldn't say watered down, but different risk management approach than the United States, which is gonna say, remove untrusted vendors. <clears throat> France is gonna say, look, I'm not gonna ban, right? This is the French approach, but I'll basically regulate them out. I'll create enough security standards that I know certain vendors just won't meet. And hey, then we, sit, we don't have those vendors in our systems. Um, Germany is gonna take a different approach, right? Both in terms of they want some security practice, but we're probably gonna see some bifurcation of their network and trying to think those things through. Uh, I don't think the solution is to retaliate against Germany because I think that we wouldn't acknowledge the underlying concerns that have led to that position. I think much more what we should be doing is trying to create viable options for Germany to move toward trusted vendors um, that are economically viable and business viable that don't put them in a position where they have to choose United States or China as their entire economic and security future, which is untenable. And then the other set of questions, and this gets back to the first conversations we were having, Perrette, is much more about how do you build and architect those systems if you're gonna have to have some untrusted vendors in those systems in the most secure way possible for key strategic allies, right? Which are the NATOs and the EU countries. And we need to be focusing as much on that because I think those countries, we're gonna have some that just are not gonna go completely cold Turkey. Um, but even if we magically get all of Europe and all of NATO to completely eliminate all untrusted vendors, really implement high security standards, Huawei and ZT aren't going away as global players. Uh, they're going to be in other regions globally. They're going to have systems in those regions. They're going to have systems in China. And at moments in time, our systems are going to have to handshake with their systems. So we should address that anyway. So I think that you know the time is ripe to do that now. But I wouldn't frame it as um, Germany is betraying their national security interest and the United States has got the better understanding of what it is. I think there's a ideal solution, obviously, um, but that may not be the reality of their domestic political situations, their geostrategic considerations, and also just the industry that they're facing. Mm. Yes, thank you. So uh, this brings me to two follow-up questions. So one mm. is, um, concerning maybe the smaller and less prosperous countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, for example, the uh, free, sea, uh, free Sea Initiative that US supports and which is kind of uh, discussed as a counter balance to the um, Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And um, I recently read an article in The Hill that argued that the US should enact a draft bill that provides funding for those countries who now um, are uh, supposed to diverge their vendors. So do you think that uh, there are some kind of uh, initiatives or, or incentives that could be offered uh, to those countries that are, are still swing countries or, or perhaps uh, uh, to help them to replace uh, Chinese vendors equipment. And the second question, uh, which comes to what you said um, in the end was that um, in terms of uh, actually increasing the understanding of interdependencies and, and of the conditions in operating in untrusted uh, networks, interior networks, uh, 
would you have some kind of concrete recommendations that, for example, what comes to my mind that should NATO agree on very high uh, political level and commitment of, of uh, securing 5G or should it go more into operational level and actually um, endorse and similar action plan to you uh, 5G toolbox and, and uh, to implement all kinds of um, strategic, regulative, uh, policy, technical measures, uh, or, or should we have some kind of um, broader alliance, for example, uh, that uh, UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson suggested uh, the then 10 uh, alliance for for critical supply chains and 5G security or how do we what would be some kind of practical measures how to 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 overcome those uh, barriers that we see right yeah now? no these are all really good questions I think um, starting with your first question which is very much about what we sometimes call as the dirt cheap problem right which is it is not it is not as if Chinese technology, specifically these types of technologies around uh, both around on cellular networks and not just limited to there, emerged out of nowhere and just like quickly ended up in these countries, right? They're, they're cheap. There are cheaper options um, and they're often sold as packages, right? Where you don't have to do a lot of the startup costs. Um, there will be teams that will help you set up your telecommunications networks and you can buy these Chinese products incredibly cheaply. Uh, that is a problem. Right? Because I think one of the things you will hear a lot is there are, there are alternatives across the stack. In our current ecosystem, and initiatives like Open RAN, which is this hope that you would open the interfaces, and if you can open interfaces in the RAN radio access network, you can diversify the number of players, you can get plug and play. So suddenly this isn't a single vertical all the way from your core to your user device. Every stage along there, you're basically plugging and playing an amazing mosaic Right, of vendors will spring up out of the ground and take advantage of that, that new opportunity. All of those things are trying to uh, specifically hint or explicitly state there are alternatives. You can choose someone other than Huawei or ZTE at each of these stages. And that is factually true, but sometimes not a viable alternative. And I think you see this in Europe, but you also see it in other parts of the world where um, they'll be really keen to be considering telecommunications or just cybersecurity more broadly. And the groups that are showing up to help them do that are not the United States and Europe. They're not on the ground. They're not offering those solutions um, at scale with serious resources attached. So I think the first question is simply, how can we make this more affordable? How can we, we're not gonna do this for free uh, because that's not the way, like the United States and I don't think Europe can fund the world's telecommunications networks at cost. It's not a, a viable economic burden, but can we, we decrease that gap a little bit for countries that need that gap decreased? Um, and are there ways of providing those incentives, both in terms of existing foreign policy levers that we already have, foreign capital investments, um, providing specific incentives for groups to invest in those countries at scale, all of these venture capital, all of these things, um, development funds are all tools that we have at our disposal. And I think we can look to historical ways in which we've addressed strategic technology and play with those mechanisms a little bit to see if you can't shrink that gap. You won't ameliorate it, it won't vanish. Might be able to shrink it. I think the other component piece of there is that um, we need to be thinking about what the burden, I guess, is on other countries to help other countries secure their networks. Um, and that's really where I'm hinting at, this can't simply be a Marshall Plan of the 21st century, right? This sort of economic burden there cannot be the same on select groups of countries, but we can be really strategic about how we invest and where we invest. And we should probably start with strategic partners in countries that we, route it, we integrate with in very um, specific ways. So I think there's, there's that conversation. Just because there's alternatives don't mean they're financially viable alternatives. What are the mechanisms we have to make those financially viable? The United States has a whole plethora of mechanisms, but the EU as well within its internal governance structures does too, right? And as does NATO. And so playing with some of those, those spaces to try to get us that equation a little bit closer to, to parity would be the goal. I think your, your second question, which is um, much more about this kind of, how do we actually secure these networks in practice and what are the, the best practices to deploy there. Um, this is a bit of a loaded question and I think it's a little bit, 
tricky because sometimes we want to instinctually give a technical answer. And the reality is that the technology and the threats we face evolve very, very quickly. So I would be hesitant to ever publish a blueprint that was so specific that is outdated tomorrow. One, probably because by the time you would get it agreed upon, it would be outdated. And then even if you magically managed to overcome that governance hurdle, you'd be in trouble um, going forward. So I do think you wanna have specific standards, but those are much more about the outcome you want to achieve, not the process required for that outcome, right? So when we're talking about concerns around confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, what are the kind of in states that we wanna see these networks hit? And then we can start talking about, and this is what's happening in standards bodies, the array of different technical approaches that can get you there or the array of different organizational approaches that can get you there. But those approaches aren't mandated because they're going to have to change, right? Depending on the architectures and the ways in those systems evolve. So yes, I do think we should be thinking about that set that's broader risk management. Um, I think the EU should be having this conversation and I know they are both around extending that toolbox of cybersecurity to 5G in particular. Uh, NATO should have a similar conversation in the same way we talk about how we secure the foundational underpinning technology in which we operate, period. This was the cybersecurity conversation back in the early 2000s. It was not about cyberspace as a domain of conflict. It was about cyberspace as your center of gravity, like how you carried out military operations in the first place. Same conversation with 5G. Um, so a lot of those platforms are already there. We simply need to extend them, um, extend them out a little bit. And I think your last question was much more about the role of these regional organizations um, and sort of the broader bringing us back to the kind of China conversation around EU, NATO, US, these sort of conversations. And I guess I'd like to maybe end as we head into the Q&A section here, really with a plea for us not to think about 5G or technology or these emerging areas of contestation like cyberspace as completely discrete from our historical relationships. Because I think there are um, a lot of good lessons and existing foundations, but in really close symmetry, even though we like to sort of talk about this gap growing between the United States and Europe, between the United States and Europe on these questions. And those are foundations. We are far closer on those questions around democracy, around privacy, even though we have very different approaches, um, around rule of law, or kind of how intellectual property should be managed these types of agreements, we're much closer together on those than we are necessarily with um, a China or a Russia on those same, same sets of questions. And so we should be pursuing those answers in those spaces in the same ways we did um, with our big trade deals of sort of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then TTIP kind of with the United States and Europe. Um, unfortunately, TTIP is, is no more, uh, but those kind of large scale agreements that really take seriously these digital infrastructure security questions as well. So yeah. it's a long answer to a broad set of <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, you answered very well. So uh, I think we have still three minutes more. Uh, so if you don't mind, maybe just uh, final um, the question uh, regarding uh, also um, perhaps a little bit different approaches uh, in, in the European continent and on US side uh, regarding the uh, French notion of strategic autonomy and also digital autonomy. So uh, do you think that if uh, Europe will be uh, able to build more our own uh, internet companies, uh, technology companies and so on, that uh, we would be more confident and, and kind of uh, less uh, concerned about the US technology and therefore, uh, or how do you see this uh, triangle between the European independent uh, capacity, the US and, and China and, and uh, how to bring Europe and, and US more together? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would almost take a step back. Sometimes these digital sovereignty conversations or strategic autonomy around technology have a bit of a false equivalency that sneaks in which is that sort of United States dominance in tech industry is the same thing as Chinese dominance in tech industry. So why should we care? We should just say no to both. Um, and that is factually incorrect, right? So the United States does have a really dominant position if you look at their companies. Those companies have a unique relationship with the United States government. These aren't intimate handshakes. And you can see that just by reading any of the US news and the sheer amount of tension that pops up between those two groups and wishing they communicated and actually spoke to each other and had some sort of cohesive US strategic plan 
um, that often is just not in place, even with those big five tech companies that often get, get referenced. So there's that distinction, the relationship between the state and their companies is really different. Rule of law, those types of questions. Also, the United States is um, a prolific cyber actor. I think it, it would be uh, disingenuous to pretend that we don't carry out our own cyber operations in this space. One of the things we do not do is forced intellectual property transfer, right? At that, at the scale of which um, China does. And that's a really different set of incentives and actions in this space. And if you are a small or medium-sized German company, your intellectual property is your value. That is where you, you sit in the market. It's not your scalability. It's that intellectual property. That's your kind of core capital investments where you get your money. And if that is the thing that gets pulled from you, that's your company's value, right? It's a, it's a real, I think, threat sometimes in the way we understand this, that the United States does not pose to German small and medium-sized businesses and doesn't pose to sort of those broader. So I would put that false equivalency. I will also say, however, um, we are sometimes quick to pretend that cyberspace or telecommunications or anything with the kind of ooh, technology, interconnected device, buzzwords attached to it are a global social public good. There are global commons. Uh, they're not. They're entirely privately owned and operated by individuals, firms, or states. These are, it's not like the ocean, right? It's not that kind of public good. Um, and states have strategic interests in their territories. And I think you see this even in the United States around data localization debates related to TikTok, right? You see this with GDPR. Right, which is very much about the European Union establishing sovereignty around its own citizens and the question of privacy. So I think there is a legitimate pushback happening to that conversation that's always been there, it's just getting a lot more attention. Um, but the question of total autonomy, I think is uh, a little fantastical, both given, I think, unfortunately, European Europe's position as a block in these supply chains and in these ecosystems, but also these are complex global ecosystems. The value we get from them is because they're complex global ecosystems. That's how we generate a lot of that value um, and are able to do the use cases that we're looking for. Semiconductors is a good example of this. That's in the news right now in a lot of ways. Um, if we get too segmented in that, every country is US only and then European only, China only, we're really actually undermining a lot of the reasons why we were in this space to begin with. So I think there's a little bit of a word of law, caution there to end us off on. Thank you very much. That's a very wise uh, summary. Thank <laughs> and you. I, I appreciate the question. <laughs> I, I have to hand over now to Thomas. Thank, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Griffith, uh, we have a number of questions in our queue. Uh, the first comes from Gary Landsman. Gary has a multi-part question. Uh, regarding 5G security concerns, specifically for sensitive military applications, <laughs> How is network resilience determined? Are there test environments that mimic in some fashion the real environment? Is there a challenge uh, mimicking the real environment? And lastly, how frequently are 5G network monitoring procedures and technologies updated? All really good questions. So I think what this question has highlighted um, is really, really important. So if you think about militaries, particularly the United States, but this is true for most countries as well, they do not operate at home, right? They operate on networks outside of their own most frequently. Uh, the United States military does not operate in New Mexico, which is where I'm currently um, located at the moment, right? A lot of their military operations are abroad, which means you're operating on networks that you maybe haven't been able to maintain, build out or control. When you think about resiliency, there are certain standards or kind of rules of thumb that are useful to always deploy. So one of them is called like the rule of three, which is for every node in your architecture have three options so you can have failures that don't cause cascades your whole system doesn't go down because resiliency is really about absorbing a big punch and carrying on critical operations not that you deflected the punch that's more security right it's like no you took a big hit but you can carry on so rules of three are one of those you do get test beds where you're trying to just kind of map out contagion or critical points of failure where are your core dependencies um, you see some of this happening at an ecosystem-wide level in the United States now with the supply chain order, which is like, where are all our gaps? Where are all the dependencies? How might these things fail and cascade? So you do get those. But the last part of that question is actually really essential, um, which is this concept of, do you always know your failure states? One of the things that makes these spaces incredibly resilient in some ways is they're incredibly complex. One of the things that can make them um, very hard to secure is they're incredibly complex. You don't always know how something is gonna engage in that environment, but you can sort of map out how you think those things might fail. 
right? What are their failure states? And you see this even all the way back with the internet, which is what are the ways in which we think that architecture that's built around certain resiliency functions might fail and can we secure for those? So I think those sort of kind of component parts pull that apart. Well, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from Jack Friedlander. Are there initiatives being discussed to develop a UN approved international law to prohibit nations from conducting cyber attacks of other countries and private business networks? Yeah, so there's been a variety of these initiatives. Um, you may be familiar with the Microsoft Digital Geneva Convention, uh, which is a real plea by a private company to consider a lot of this infrastructure as civilian, right? That these are collateral damage that you don't go after civilian targets in times of, um, in times of conflict and to rule it off. So there's those kind of levels of agreement that are pushing through. You'll see a lot of the work that is happening at Talon, at CCDCOE, which I'm sure Pere can speak to as well, around rules like regulations and laws in times of conflict that look a lot at these same questions. And then you also have a lot of bilateral movement uh, where single countries like the United States and China, the United States and Russia will try to come to some agreement about what's off limits and try to set up some kind of norms of behavior that you don't attack critical infrastructure um, willy nilly or you don't attack it at all types of kind of boundary setting, and this is where you get the idea of agreed competition. The states are really through the UN, through international law more broadly, um, through our bilateral agreements, through our signaling, really trying to set up a base of, we are okay to comp compete here with you, but stay out of these sectors, don't go there. Nuclear command and control would be an example of don't go there, right? That's an area you don't screw around in, compete somewhere else. So yes, on all of those levels, there's been quite a bit of activity. And I don't know if Perret wants to jump in here because I know NATO CCDOE does a lot on law and governance in this space as well. Perret, did you want to add anything? Put you on the spot, apologies. <laughs> uh, sorry, I think uh, I was muted. Uh, yes, uh, just to add that um, maybe to the first question as well, that uh, in terms of testing, then, as I said, our own center is, is having a, building a test lab uh, for the open run solutions, but there are several of those uh, that uh, militaries use, for example, Norway, uh, Latvia, of course, the US, and then there are specific um, um, standards, I would say, and procedures. For example, one is a GSM and NESAS uh, assessment uh, framework. So, but it's it's very technical answer. So, <laughs> apologies for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, regarding the norms, uh, yes, the uh, conversations in UNGG and open-ended working groups are, are going on. There are lots of initiatives in uh, non-profit organizations and, and other um, also by the private sector, as, as Melissa mentioned. And um, so, but uh, of course, you know, there is also, I would say, uh, still kind of uh, quite clear opposition between the, let's say, the author authoritarian view and then the like-minded countries. Uh, so, so we will see how these will play out <laughs> in the future discussions on the UN level. Uh, thank you for that perspective, Pirat. Uh, this next question comes from Gerard Doyle. It would seem that technology is becoming so complex that humans will not be able to monitor technology for security issues or other issues. Do you see artificial intelligence and machine learning becoming the only way to monitor technology? Um, so I'm not sure it would be ever become the only way because I think there's a lot of opportunities to still keep a hand on the wheel or a human in that process. Uh, but there is absolutely correct to point out that specifically as we move toward 5G networks, the level of complexity is becoming really difficult to handle. So there's this interesting feedback loop that actually happens between 5G and AI. These are kind of ecosystems. You hear 5G, cloud, AI, robotics, all of these things are supporting each other in their development. When it comes to AI and 5G, you have this opportunity of a huge amount of data, which helps feed AI, right? That's one of one part of that three part triangle around algorithms, data, and compute. Data is a big piece of that AI puzzle huge input material, but in the same time as they're managing a lot of that complexity, AI is going to have, or excuse me, is benefiting from that data. AI comes in and helps manage that complexity just in terms of daily operations, not necessarily in terms of security 
is a security product and then requires security oversight of its own because it is in fact software with its own sets of security concerns. So it actually creates this much more complicated interaction than I think some of us uh, traditionally start off with. But it is a great question, both as something that benefits from 5G, helps us manage that complexity, helps us manage security, and then introduces security concerns into that system at the same time. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Stephen Shore, and you may have to put on your economist hat for this one. Uh -huh. Uh, Stephen points out that China continues to buy treasury bills and other dollar denominated debt, if for no other reason than a lack of a better alternative. Uh, so doesn't the US benefit enormously from their doing this? And, and then I'll add, you know, what are the implications for cybersecurity? Yeah, so I am not an economist, I'm a national security scholar, so I can't comment on um, the ways in which countries acquire wealth or debt from each other. And there's a whole kind of group of literature, other experts that would be far more detailed in their answers to that. I do think there is though a broader concern that that is pointing to, which is a dependency question, right? Which is that the United States benefits a lot from China in terms of the markets and the liquidity we get and sort of the economic kind of backfeed that we get from China. But we also really depend on those same systems and on China buying into US systems, on being a market for goods, on production and manufacturing for those goods. And this is really that critical interdependency questions and how you manage that complexity. I think it kind of takes us to the way back at the start where I was sort of pushing it back against this idea that somehow the United States would emerge victorious and China would just somehow vanish right off the playing field. They wouldn't be competing in technology. They wouldn't be in place in the global economy. We have spent a serious amount of our time as the United States telling China to get involved in standards bodies, to be involved in the global economy, um, to take seriously its role in the international system. They have shown up. We're not thrilled in the way that they have shown up, um, but that doesn't mean that we can just somehow squash them. We're gonna have to figure out some way that um, these two countries can coexist in a way that still maximizes our security because I am American and I care about that outcome, um, but doesn't require us to be kind of fantastical in our thinking that we will have no dependencies, that there will be no interconnections between the United States and China, and that China will not operate anywhere in the world, let alone in China. I think that sometimes is how we boil these down. Okay, uh, we have a few more. Uh, this next question comes from my fellow World Affairs Council of Orange County Board Director, uh, Rick Putnam. And Rick asks, what are your predictive scenarios for how Chinese intrusion, the data, data use slash leverage might play out in harmful and ultimately alarming ways? Mm. We're asking you to go dark. Yes, I'll put on my dark hat. No, this is, this is a good question. So I think it's sort of, um, how might we expect the ways in which China may engage with the United States? So there's an existing pattern of behavior, and these are sort of threat groups like APT1, that got a lot of attention with that Mandiant, now part of FireEye report that kind of very clearly pointed the finger um, at a government for the first time, private security firm, that are very targeted on intellectual property and espionage, right? So um, targeting universities, specific industries, aerospace, defense, industrial base, very focused on those specific communities. And we've already seen that significant exfiltration. That's an established pattern that predates um, cybersecurity, that kind of exfiltration. So there's those types of models. I think you will hear people become increasingly concerned about CNA, so that's that computer network attack models for intrusion. So CNE is the espionage side of the coin, where the only thing that's been compromised is confidentiality of the data. When we start talking a lot more about CNA, we mean those big Ds, disrupt, degrade, destroy, um, disconnect, those kind of big, big the four Ds on that side. When we think about that category of events, um, I think it is notable that there haven't been as many of those targeting the United States from China in that category. That's largely because we are not actively jostling with China in that way. So a lot of those types of operations happen to be in conflict zones or against countries where there's an ongoing potential for conflict. So this is the interesting positions that, for example, Estonia found itself in 2007 with Russia, a really hot geopolitical tension there that had some military leaders quite alarmed. Um, it's the position that an Israel finds itself in. It's not typically the position the United States finds itself in. China's not interested in that level 
of engagement with the United States at this moment, which is comforting, a comforting thought, right? They wanna compete below that threshold of, of what we would deem to be armed conflict. I think the other piece of that that we tend to only refer to when we talk about Russia is influence operations, which is actually something China does carry out really readily within its own country, but also within its sort of regional area. Um, when you think about Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan more broadly, and then similarly, has carried out. You've seen some kind of interesting examples of influence operations in the United States elections as well, that they have a slightly different preference on maybe who they would like to see win that election than a Russia um, and a slightly different preference than a, than a China or Taiwan, excuse me, or a Iran. So you see the influence operations as well mm. as a third piece. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Brody Hilt. Which government agencies are striving to protect us against attacks like solar winds? And do you think we'll be able to, uh, we will be able to be successful in protecting the United States and US companies? This is a great question. And I really love the organizational spin on this because I think a lot of our conversation about the solar winds hack, although solar winds is just one vector, uh, it's actually much more complicated than just that one vendor um, software supply chain. But when we talk about that, we often will talk about how to prevent initial entry, which is the software supply chain security conversation. How do they get into our networks and how do we prevent that? And that's about trust and how you kind of certify along a software supply chain. Or we'll say, how do we dissuade or deter adversaries from carrying out those operations? So this is when in the United States, you'll hear a lot of conversation about whether or not deterrence is vi like viable around espionage operations. If the US DOD's um, persistent, excuse me, uh, defend forward and then cyber commands version of that, which is persistent engagement has been working or not working if we're seeing this type of activity, all of that is focusing on prevention, right? Not gaining access to your network in the first place. What this question is really asking, and I think this is really critical is what do you do when they're in the network? Right? They've gotten in and they've maintained some persistence. What does your incident response look like? Because that's going to happen. Right? You're not going to turn everybody away. You're not going to dissuade everybody, prevent everybody from gaining initial access. And so entry, there's a lot of presence and persistence in our networks. That question for the United States is as much a question about organizational practice as it is about technology. So when you look at the solar winds hack, there was a couple of failures that are notable. Um, one, and you'll talk to private companies, and this is very true, is that they didn't chase down leads. And this happened in the US government as well. They would detect a malicious activity, whether that was pivoting or lateral movement within a network, that somebody's already in your network and moving around maliciously, and they would address that issue and not dig deeper and notice that it was a wider pattern. That's a problem. Um, and it took a while for them to suddenly realize that maybe this was industry-wide. That was really a fire eye led uh, move at that point. And I think it is telling that they reached first most heavily for their kind of um, industry partners in the space. And we're looking for a lot of visibility into that network, right? So these big players like the Microsofts and the Googles that see a lot of data, Fire actually is a limited pool of what they see, just their customers, right? These threat intelligence firms. So they reach there. On the US government side, not just from FireEye, this is a, a common industry concern. That is still, unfortunately, though it has gotten better, a heavy one-way street. Um, so there was a lot of conversation from industry about reaching out to government, feeling like they were giving a lot of information and didn't get actionable information back, um, that it didn't feel like that was coming back. And they'll readily say, I can't tell you what's happening in the government networks. No idea. No idea what the state of that kind of looked like or if this was as prevalent. And maybe we'll have a better idea with like, in one network, but not on treasury or state or what was going on in defense, no idea. So there's that concern. When you look at the ecosystem, the groups that were sort of the most prevalent and probably the incident response, at least according to industry would be CISA, which is sort of an information coordinating best practice head and is responsible for critical infrastructure, um, but notably doesn't have very many care. They have a lot of carrots, no sticks, which means they weren't able to really compel a lot of industry to release data and be able to act on that data. Um, the compellent stick lands with the FBI, which is why companies like FireEye immediately start trying to figure out which FBI office is responsible for this particular incident, which is a little bit like whack-a-mole. You've got to shop around, figure out which regional office uh, is in charge, and then hope that they can do some subpoenas and actually start using some carrots and sticks, that second piece, to get you some actionable intelligence. Um, but yeah, I think that we talk about our, how we fell down is largely that they got in, I think we need to be talking about where the United States really fell down is how long they were in those networks and some of our organizational operational best practices and that we frequently reference and we made a lot of progress toward whole of government, let alone whole of society, which is government and industry. We are far short of that bar. Um, and that's on big red letter displays with this incident. Mm 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Griffith. And thank you again, Pirrit. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. So I wanna to apologize to those uh, who asked questions that we were unable to get to. Uh, thank you for a, a, a fascinating conversation. And uh, now I'd like to treat it, uh, turn it, excuse me, I'd like to turn it over to Nora Valenzuela, the chair of the World Affairs Council of Orange County to conclude our program. Nora. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, uh, it was indeed very informative, Dr. Griffith and also Ms. Pernick. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really glad you touched base on the organizational best practices. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I am in the field of IT, and one of the biggest challenges we see is the processes organization used for data sanitization or not data sanitization. And a lot of times, um, because our government is very different than other countries. In many countries, they're centralized. So when they do things, they do it in a centralized way. In US, we are federal, state, city, and counties. And in many cases, the systems have to be connected with each other. So if in one entity, we don't do proper data sanitization, it can be used as a gateway into going to other areas. And that's why the, the whole solar wind end up being kind of scary because it could, that we are still on the county level trying to figure out the areas where we've been impacted you know although the gateway was on a federal level so that's really interesting and also on the ai side i totally agree with you um, the data and the algorithm behind it are to totally different things the man still or mankind or human beings are still the one creating the algorithm so that that's an area where um we're still gonna be very much involved and not excluded and AI will not take over. So thank you so much. We really appreciate, I hope, um, we appreciate that you stay up so late, uh, Ms. Pernick. We know that it's almost 12 midnight there in your part of the world. Uh, we thank all of our guests. Um, I see Richard Downey online. Richard, do you mind just saying hello? Our uh, chair of the program committee, um, was able to join us a bit late. I see him joining us. So Richard, are you here to? Yes, thank you, Nora. Dr. Griffith, thank you so much for a fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating presentation. I apologize. I was not able to get on. I had some medical issues. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to listen, but uh, wasn't, uh, unfortunately, was not able to get involved and, and to meet you. And Dr. Pernick, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have both of you on. I hope we can have you on in person in the future. But thank you, Nora. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, Colonel Downey, it's a new member of our organization for the past two or four years, and it's been amazing, the contribution he's brought. So I just wanted him from his sick bed to say hello to us. We thank you for your time. We, I hope that uh, in future, we will have an opportunity of having you in person so we can meet you in person and benefit from your knowledge. We thank all of our audience on behalf of the World Affair Council of Orange County and our Board of Trustees, thanking all of our members and also guests uh, nationwide today. Thank you and have a safe uh, afternoon. Good day. Thank you.